Good morning. How are you this, let's see, Thursday, May the 28th, I think. I don't know about anybody else, but I lost track a long time ago, and then this last week has kind of exacerbated the problem for me. But anyway, I'm just so glad that you're going to join me this morning uh, here in this Bible study. You know, if you get a chance, uh, like we say almost every time, do just share out your feed if you want, and that way a few more folks can see it. But uh, I'm just glad you have come to join me. And oh, how thankful I am that I get to join you. Um, one week ago today, um, I was, as most all of you know, I was living with some pain in my stomach area and thought it would go away, but it didn't. And um, finally, of course, had my surgery on Friday, and how thankful I am to you for the way you have prayed for me and lifted me up, and um, I'm just glad to begin to start to get back to some type of normalcy for myself, and uh, I look forward to today. I look forward to the subject that we have chosen for today, and that it will be an encouragement to you and to me. So let me have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each one that have Joined, uh, joined us this morning. I pray that that this topic of our day will be a uh, will be a blessing and would encourage our hearts. And that Lord, that your promises are true, and because faithful is He who promised, who will also do it. I thank you for remaining faithful to us. I pray that as we turn our attention to your Word for at least a few minutes, that your Son, our Savior would be glorified in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you know, um, I did want to just say that uh, if you are uh, at all uh, wondering what all this week holds, don't forget um, that Sunday we'll be together for 10 o'clock in the morning, and then we'll do our our next hymn saying and um, I, I know I keep hearing that maybe there's still room for one more hymn to be to be suggested and all of that. So um, if you want to participate in that, that would be great. All right. I have one more thing, and I didn't bring a device. I forgot, but I have one more. I have one more uh, sort of survey to do, and I do this with fear and trepidation, even though I know what the final answer is really going to be. Uh, but, you know, a little over a week ago now, I, I I felt so sick I haven't even shaved, right? So now I look like an old man with my beard kind of growing out, right? So here's what I want you to do. During the, during the lesson time, you put keep the beard, shave the beard, okay? Now, again, it, it doesn't matter what the, it could be 90% keep, and I'm quite sure I'll be shaving, but... Um, you know, you can't hardly see it. You know, it's kind of, kind of just all scraggly. Kind of looks like the, as I like to say, the drunken sailor stage. But uh, uh, I'm sure I'll. I haven't had my full beard for, I don't even know how many years. So anyway, uh, I was just trying to get a little back up that I don't look that bad. But anyway, I want you to remember. I want you to turn, if you would, to Second Peter chapter. One, that's where we began this all a week and uh, a little over a week ago. Second Peter chapter 1, it says this, uh, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and, and excellence, by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises 
so that by them we may become partakers of the divine nature um, and uh, having been accepted, having, excuse me, escaped the corruption that is in the world. You know, we began just by simply saying that God has placed throughout the word of God promises, promises that he made to sometimes certain people at certain times for certain things that certainly by application we can we can learn from them, but they're not necessarily directed to us, whereas there are other promises very directly given to us that we can claim because he promised them to us. Well, there is one promise that I want you to focus on with me this morning, and I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1, and uh, we're going to look at the theme this morning of the promise of salvation. You know, most of us this morning would remember that the need of salvation was because our forefathers, Adam and Eve, were created holy with what theologians call untested holiness. And they were put in a perfect environment that the Bible calls the Garden of Eden. And they were given certain uh, certain roles and responsibilities to, provide, to, to do in the Garden of Eden. Well, we all know that they weren't there very long and Satan came along and tempted them and they sinned and they fell. And, and uh, so upon that fall, um, God had already created a system whereby he could restore that relationship to his creatures. Now, anytime I think about salvation, I always remind myself, and I want to remind you again, that God was under no obligation to provide a redemptive program for lost and fallen humanity. How can I say that so dogmatically? I can say it because there was a group of created beings called the angels who fell before man did, and God provided no redemptive program for the angels. He could have. He could have just as well provided a system whereby fallen angels could have been redeemed, but he didn't. That, that wasn't because God wasn't merciful to them or graceful to them. God's always merciful and graceful and loving. It was just that in his providence and in his choice, he decided that he wouldn't provide a redemptive program. So never read the early chapters of Genesis and somehow think that God was under some obligation to provide a redemptive program for us. He wasn't. And so God loved us, and he sent, he, 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 he initiated a program whereby he could redeem mankind. And of course, we know that that involved the sending of his son. I suspect, and I often say this at a funeral, that if there was any Bible verse that anybody ever learned at any time in their in their growing up years or at any time in their life, it's one of two verses. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But the second one is the one that maybe is the most familiar Bible verse in all of the Bible. And you could say it with me there in your, in wherever you're at in front of your screen. Let's say it together as best we can. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who, excuse me, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I mean, the entire gospel is distilled in actually that one verse. And we've actually taken time over the years to break it down and look at every word. And I mean, that's not what we're going to do today. The gospel of John was written as the gospel of, of the gospel, right? I mean, certainly all the gospels were records of the life of Jesus Christ, and it's the good news. That's what we know the word gospel means. It's the good news of the life of Christ. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all give us a, a, a somewhat chronological, certainly subject, uh, a, 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 a theme of his life according to some subjects. And, and in John's case, it was seven signs that pointed out who Jesus was. In John 20, we don't have to wonder why John wrote. He said, I write these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, 
the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. There are three verses in the first chapter of the Gospel of John that always stand out to me when I think of the promise that God made for salvation for us. If you have your Bible there, begin at verse 11 with me. We're going to read John 1, verses 11 to 13. And he came unto his own, that is Jesus. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as did receive him, <clears throat> he then gave the authority or the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You know, once again, when we think about redemption, salvation, the promise of salvation, we need to always recognize that it took the Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnation, the coming into this world of the perfect Son of God into an imperfect sinful world in order to live a life that was perfect, to die on a cross as the perfect sinless sacrifice, to provide a redemptive purchase price for us as lost sinners. Well, I don't know about you, but when I think of John 1.11, I, my mind goes back to family gatherings. You know, uh, this last weekend was what is known as Memorial Day. When I was a kid growing up around my grandparents' farm in Pennsylvania, do you know what we called it? Dave Gillies knows, because Dave Gillies put up on Facebook, didn't you, Dave? Uh, what's the, what was um, Memorial Day and, um, and uh, well, anyway, what was Memorial Day known as? Sorry, my mind's still a little bit foggy. Memorial Day, when I grew up, I knew it as Decoration Day. And what it meant was we would gather, many, many of the shoemaker family members would gather there in, at the farm there, and we would go out to the cemeteries and we would decorate the graves. Trust me, as a 12, 13-year-old kid, it was a little depressing. The only reason, the only thing that made it look good was because we looked forward to having the hot dogs and all that. Our McCarty family would almost always gather on places like July 4th and other times, and we would have these great picnics. I can, right now, I picture the side yard of my home on James Avenue in Akron. Man, I can remember our family just gathered on the side yard of our house, my grandma and my grandpa and my aunts and my uncles and my cousins, and there would be my uncles and my dad, and they'd be cooking barbecue, I mean, not, you know, natural gas, not um, uh, propane or anything, but, you know, put the barbecue things in there and put the barbecue lighter on and wait two or three hours before the, the uh, coals ever got good enough. And man, we'd have some of the best hamburgers and hot dogs. And those family gatherings of the McCarty's and shoemakers are tremendous memories for me. But can you imagine what I would have felt like if if I had shown up to either one of those and I'd say, hi, hi guys, how you doing? And they looked at me and said, who are you? Um, I'm Roger, B Bob and Edna's son. We, we don't know you. And I would call out to them, Uncle Jerry, Aunt Betty, Aunt Betty, Uncle Ross, you know, Uncle Johnny, Aunt Joanne. I mean, uh, Uncle Jerry, Aunt Snooks. I, I mean, can you imagine if I were to start to cry out to my family members, my brother, my sister? I mean, and I said, y you know me? And they were saying, we, didn't, we don't know you. Get out of here. You are not welcome at this family gathering because you don't belong. Can you just imagine? Imagine for yourself what that would feel like. That's basically what happened to Jesus. He came unto his own people, really his own world, I mean, the world that he created, he came and he was not welcomed. He was rejected. He was not received. And so he turned to others who did receive him. You know, 
that word there to, to the, as many as did receive him. Again, it's an idea of to welcome. It had the idea of a, of a person coming to your home and being, and being welcomed in to your fellowship, welcomed in to your family, to as many as received him. You know, throughout the New Testament and in other places, it talks about that. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 says, As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Again, there was a, there was a reception. There was an understanding that you were welcoming this person in. Now, I want you to understand, I... I get the doctrine of theology, uh, uh, the theology of salvation. So don't get, don't, don't, don't become too disturbed if you don't hear me say a word or two that you think I should. I, I understand it, but in this text it said, "For as many as received him." For those that came to a point of saying, "No, I want you in my life." The second word in the verse says, "To as many as received him." To those who believed on his name. To those who believed. I mean, once again, the, the topics that we need to believe as to, to be, receive the promise of salvation are things like, I have to believe that I'm actually a sinner. I have to believe that I'm actually lost. That I'm actually dead in my trespasses and sins. Again, it's not a pretty picture that anyone paints for a lost person. You don't tell a person they're really a good person and Jesus is just waiting to welcome them with open arms. We have to tell them that they are lost and they are dead and they are sinners. And yet Jesus is still willing to receive them if they will believe in his name. In his name. Do you remember how the book of Acts puts it? Maybe you've memorized that verse, Acts 4.12. There is one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's necessary to be saved in the one and only name. You know, there are so many religions that dot this world, is there not? I mean, religions that are larger even than Christianity, if it could be such a thing certainly larger than what I would consider biblical Christianity. Billions of people lost in their sins because they have chosen to believe in a name that will never bring salvation and redemption. To those that believe in his name, I mean, it isn't just a head knowledge belief. It's not an acknowledgement that Jesus was a good person and a and a great teacher, and a, we have to believe that he is the one and only Savior. What I've often said to people about Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. He can't be your shepherd until he's your Savior. I think some people try to claim him as their shepherd, as their friend, as their, as their companion, as their counselor, I mean, all kinds of things without ever going through the door marked Savior. And if you don't go through the door marked Savior, you don't get what this verse says. Because then it says you have the authority. It's a really interesting word. You have the right or the authority to be called the children of God. The word here for children, there's two or three words in the New Testament, but many of you already know this word means a born one. Technon is the word. And technon means one that has been born into your family, as opposed to a son or a daughter, which kind of denominates what they are, as, a, as it were. This, this just simply looks at the fact that they were born. They are a product of a mother and a father. I have five children. They are technon to me. They aren't necessarily technon to anyone else. They could be adopted, but they're not really technon to them. They're not born ones to them. To me, I have five born ones. I had a direct, uh, I had a direct uh, part in that. I'm their father. Well, John says that if we receive and believe, we get the authority. We have the standing 
as a child of God, God promises to make us not the child of the devil any longer, but to be his child. Think about it. His ch the child of God, the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, the king of kings and the lord of lords, the, the God of all creation is our father. That's the idea in technon, children of God. We have a father, a spiritual father, and he promises to be that for us. He promises to be our our, uh, the one that, that gives us birth. In verse 13, then, it says, you who were born. Again, the idea of being born there means to, 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 to be part of a generation. It's just, again, the word that, just like any children are born, it just means to be born. Children are born. Now, I want to just spend the last few minutes that we have together with the three what seem like fairly enigmatic statements, actually. Until many years ago, I began to, I think, get a little better handle, a little better understanding of what these meant. They really seemed out of place. At least one of them did, for sure. It says, we are born not of blood. I'm going to give you three words that will rhyme if you, if you care. Word number one, we are not born by our generation. What's that mean? These are not born as children of God because of my family background. You know, in the time that John wrote the gospel, in the time when Jesus came, that John wrote about in the gospel of John, the Jews, of course, were God's chosen people. And all through the gospel of John, you can read it over and over again. I mean, there was this huge cry from people like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes that we are the children of Abraham. Like we are the descendants of Moses. They took great pride in their generation, in their genealogy, as it were. Why do you think there are nine chapters in the first book of Chronicles of name after name after name? Because they took so much pride in who their family was, who their, who their ancestors were. Now, there was reason for that. If you were going to be in the priesthood, you had to show direct lineage and all of that. I mean, I, I understand that. And you, they were wanting to show direct lineage to which tribe they were a part. And, I mean, there's, there were good reasons for it. But do you remember when Paul gave his testimony in Philippians chapter 3? Do you remember what he said? He said, before I was saved, he said, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was basically saying, I'm a blue blood Jew. I had royalty, in a sense, flowing through my veins. Oh, he took great pride in who his family was. He took great pride in, in, the, in the standing of his family in Judaism. Sometimes children grow up in church in our day, and they... They take great pride in who their parents are. My five children had to overcome the reality that they are pastor's children. I didn't get them to heaven. It's because I'm a believer and Beth's a believer and we serve Jesus in a church. I didn't I didn't I wasn't gonna buy them any eternal destiny in heaven. Sometimes people grow up and they say, Oh, but my my grandparents were great missionaries or great servants in the church. Some of you watching this, you have served the Lord so many years. And the fear is that some of our children or our grandchildren will think that they get in because of, because of our decision. Nope. John said we're not born because of our bloodline. Secondly, notice he says we're not born because of the will of the flesh. We're not born because of the will of the flesh. The word I came upon many years ago was this word. We're not born again because of reformation. Because I reform my life. There are some really good programs out there. Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, um, 
uh, and, and other such programs, 12-step programs. And there are many, many people who have left a life of, of, in a sense, debauchery and drunkenness and all the rest of it and have been sober for years and years and years. And they have turned their life around. They went from truly living in the ditch to, to you know, having a normal life. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I had a I had a dear friend that that his life was very much impacted by the 12 step program. I mean, he he was he had dealt with drugs and alcohol and got into that and became sober and uh it, 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 he turned his life around. Now, praise the Lord, he also made a profession of faith in Christ and I had the privilege of baptizing him and so I trust that all of that was real, but you can go to heaven as a drunk or you can go to heaven, excuse me, you can go to hell, excuse me, let me go back. You can go to hell as a drunk or you can go to hell as a, as a sober person. Doesn't matter. Just reforming your life is not being born again. Living an upstanding moral life does not get you to heaven. Hey, listen, I'm the first to agree that there are some people in the world who probably live a better life than some Christians. There are some people in this world that they never drink, never smoke. I mean, they never curse. I mean, they're, they, they, they don't put anything in their body that, that would be debilitating. I mean, there are some people in this world that are, that are, from a world standpoint, really good. But they're rotten inside. My experience with my with my gallbladder surgery reminded me of that. You know, I mean, until I got pretty sick on Tuesday of last week, I I didn't look so bad, did I? I mean, I I looked like I was quote healthy as a horse, only to find out that inside me there was a debilitating disease, whatever you want to call it, going on. That whew, if I had waited another day, my doctor told me I could have had a really different outcome. Some people look really good on the outside and they still are rotten to the core. He said, we're not saved by the will of the flesh. It's not me, it's not me pulling myself up by my bootstraps. It's not me somehow implementing all kinds. It, it's about God. It's the third one that always sort of was even more so just hard to understand until I came across a, until I came across a word. It says, and you're not saved by the will of man, by the will of man. I mean, what is that? Let me give you a word, confirmation. That means nobody else can, nobody else can, uh, can acquire salvation for you. You can do all these religious activities and some religious leader you know, taps you and says you've been confirmed in the faith as if somehow their word, their touch, their, their ritual somehow brings you to faith. It's not by the will of man. Nobody else can bring you to heaven. I don't know about you, but I know there are people in my life that I long to see come with me to heaven. I know even last night in our prayer meeting, we were talking about praying for some people who who are lost, who have heard the gospel just any number of times, who have been so convinced by science and by by all kinds of other things and they just they just don't seem willing to make any change. N nobody can make the decision for that person. Oh how we want to take that person to heaven with us. But it's not by the will of man. I can't do that for you. Some of you may be watching this morning and you've heard of this promise of salvation, but you've also understood what you need to believe and receive and repent and all those things. And you just, you just, you just don't want to do that. You just would rather live your own life. And so it was on the cross of Calvary where one sinner was willing to admit his need and the other one wasn't. It's not by the will of the will of man. It's not by confirmation. So it's not by generation, reformation, or confirmation. 
There's only one way redemption comes. The promise of salvation is only brought to us in one way. It's three little words at the end of verse 13. But of God. It's regeneration. Regeneration. That theological term that has been given to us about about how we are saved. We are born again of God. We are born of God. God comes and gives us life. He comes to the dead, lost sinner, and he infuses spiritual life, and he comes alive by faith in Jesus Christ. Trust me, it's a, if I can use the word, I've kind of used it a couple of times this last week in some other regards, but it's a collaborative effort. God comes and, and gives us life and we call on the name of the Lord to be saved, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Trust me, no one gets to heaven without calling on the name of the Lord. No one gets to heaven without recognizing their need of a Savior. No one gets to heaven without crying out to God. Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But I won't call unless God comes and brings me to that place. Oh, the promise of salvation. Grace. Last night in prayer meeting, we sang one of my all-time favorite songs, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. You know, when you think about that song, Wonderful Grace of Jesus, I, I, the, the words of it, and part of why I love that song, when I was a kid growing up, we had an assistant pastor. His name was Pastor Ken O'Neill. Oh my goodness, Pastor Ken O'Neill was a kind of a bit of a heavy set guy, and he uh, he was he'd been saved from a pretty rotten background, as I recall. But man, that guy! Oh, when he sang that song, I mean the rafters shook. That's why I never sing it without singing in the chorus. Sing it! Oh, he would. I just when I sing that song, I think of Pastor Ken O'Neill singing it and recognizing what God's grace has done in our lives the promise of salvation this morning do you know him i don't mean do you know about him i don't mean do you know bible passages i'm not asking you today if you have gone through some religious ritual i'm not asking if you've been baptized i'm not asking if you've been catechized I'm not asking I'm asking if in your heart right now you have beyond any shadow of a doubt you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to as many as received him to them he gave the authority to become the technon of God the children of God even to those who believe in his name who were born not of the will of the flesh not of the will of man not of blood but of God. Listen, we will uh, we will see you on Sunday, ten o'clock, and uh, we're going to be back in the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to uh, pick that up again. And I look forward to that so much. I just can never thank you enough for those of you that have been praying for us. I am uh, pray for my family. I'm not sure I'm a great patient. Uh, and uh, so they've been very gracious to me, but uh, thank you so much. And I know some of you that are watching today, I'm, I, I don't have the list in front of me, but normally I know the names that are on there. And some of you are the ones who came and waved at me in my window. And I could never tell you what that meant, that you would drive over and just wave at a window when you couldn't probably see a whole lot that was there. And uh, you just keep praying for me that I'll just get stronger and that everything will go well. Let me pray and I'll let you go. Father, thank you so much for your mercy and grace to us. Thank you for redemption that brings us out of light and, Father, in, out of darkness and into light. That brings us from death to life. Thank you that you have provided it for us. And now today, may 
we that know you as Savior, may we, may we give you glory for what you've done in our life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. We will see you on Sunday. So long. Thank <laughs> you.